we welcome you to the Priscilla R. Tyson Cultural Arts Center for our conversations and coffee today, January 18th, 2024. I'm Ellen O'Shaughnessy, coordinator of the program. Max, Adrian, we are grateful to you for being our most recent artist in residence here at the Cultural Arts Center and being our guest today for our conversations and coffee. Your textiles and soft sculpture in our loft gallery are amazing, engaging. Huh? <laughs> tell us, we will be hearing what you're going to tell us about it. Hmm? We're sharing with you, with other residences, we're sharing you with other residences you've also served in. New York, Gatlinburg, Tennessee, Johnson, Vermont, Kansas City, Missouri. Second site project here in Columbus, the New York Studio Residency Program in Brooklyn, New York. You share with us that you are a textile artist interested in ideas about queerness, desire, and consumerism. Your soft sculptural practice finds inspiration in a variety of sewing-related crafts like quilting, bag making, inflatables, puppetry, drag, and fetish wear. Max employs an evocative aesthetic of bold colors and tactile materials that tease expectations of fun and pleasure. His work envisions a postmodern playscape where bodies and objects are blurred, asking how things we desire impact a sense of personal identity and community building in the midst of a culture of hyper-stimulation. Max received a Master of Fine Arts in 2021 in Fiber and Material Studies from the Tyler School of Art and Architecture in Philadelphia. He received a Bachelor of Fine Arts in Fiber and Creative Writing from the Kansas City Art Institute in 2015. Max was awarded a 2023 Individual Excellence Award from the Ohio Arts Council. Max's recent exhibition history includes shows at the Houston, Texas Center for Contemporary Craft, the Columbus Museum of Art, the Charlotte Street Foundation in Kansas City, Missouri. Max has been supported, as we shared earlier, by many residencies, as well as fellowships. Often people, having seen Max's work held up, they say, what are residencies? Is he sleeping here at night? Is he going to be with us uh, in a way like a hotel? So I said, no, I think possibly I'm going to call on our assistant director, Todd Camp. Come on here, Todd, and tell us what a artist in residency is about. Thanks, Ellen. Good afternoon. I'm Todd Camp, and one of my responsibilities here at the center is to be the coordinator of the Artist in Residence, so we call it AIR, A-I-R, Artist in Residence, for short. Uh, this program was launched about two years ago, thanks to the uh, donations from, or our funding from the Ohio Arts Council that helps to support this program. And we have uh, a process where we put out a call for artists to submit their work uh, for the residency, which is 16 weeks. Uh, there's a stipend involved with that and a, a studio uh, right below us here for the artists to work in. Uh, during that time of the residency, uh, they do get to produce a, a body of work then, which gets shown in the loft gallery right out here. Sleeping, not so much, uh, although maybe uh, Max was sleeping here because he was working all the time. So uh, 
there, but this is a non-live-in residency. Uh, there are live-in residencies where folks can go and, uh, and reside for the period uh, during the residency. So the process is we hire a panel of folks uh, from the arts community, from our students here, from our board members, and they get the task of choosing two artists per year. And so Max is our uh, uh, ending our year for uh, this session, and we will have uh, our next artist in residence, Grace Johnson, who will start in February. So that will be our next artist in residence here at the center. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So, artist in residence, we are so happy to have you with us. Take it away. All right. Well, thank you for that introduction, Ellen. Um, Hi, everyone. It feels kind of funny to be speaking into a microphone with a small group here. But um, yeah, it's been such a pleasure to be here at the Cultural Arts Center for the last four months or so. It's crazy how much this time has flown by. Um, and it's a privilege to be able to share about my work with you all um, this afternoon. Um, so as Ellen was saying, I'm a, an artist working mostly in textiles and soft sculpture. Sewing is my main process in my work. Um, and I'll be speaking about my practice pretty, pretty broadly, um, talking about my journey in soft sculpture, how I came from college into the work that I'm doing now. And at the end, I'll talk a little bit about the, the work that's in the loft gallery right now, which is still so like fresh and new, and I'm still trying to figure out what it even is. Um, so to rewind a bit, this is kind of like a fun fact um, sort of thing. I initially went to art school to study animation. And these stills are from one of the only animations I did during that time uh, of just this little cycle of a girl finding a magic jump rope. And as she's jumping in the jump rope, she transforms into new things like a peanut and a cockroach. Um, so the things that I loved about animation, this playfulness, this um, personification of objects, a sense of narrative, um, really a sense of transformation. Um, those were the things that took me into animation. And they're also the things that I took with me into fiber and textile work. So even though they seem like very different disciplines, um, for me, I still see a lot of things like carrying um, through. But animation just wasn't uh, the discipline that that clicked with me. Uh, I only lasted about five weeks in this program. And one day I was sitting at my light table um, drawing just an animation of my hand turning. And I like looked out my window like, I hate this. And out on the green, I saw a group of fiber students erecting a giant woven banner and dancing around it. And I was like, those people are having fun. I don't know what they're doing, but they're having fun. I'm not having fun. I need to go be with the people who are having fun. So Monday that week, I was at my light table. By Friday, I was dressing a loom as a full-on fiber major. So I made a switch and didn't really know what I would do in there. Um, but I still had those same interests that I was talking about um, that came into the work that I started to explore. So this is the kind of work that I was doing as an undergrad. Um, very improvisational, soft sculptures that would seem kind of frozen in a moment of animation or, or waiting to be interacted with in a way. Uh, it was also during this time that I developed my visual vocabulary of certain colors, um, bold, high saturated, high contrast colors that relate to sports or advertising, things that are really trying to grab your attention. Um, also certain materials that are really tactile and have certain associations to play performance, costume, um, sports, toys, that kind of thing. Um, this next piece is one of the last things I made uh, in, in undergrad. Um, so theater and performance and drag have always been really big creative influences for me. And that comes through in some of the material choices and design choices that I make in the work. Um, so this piece here is kind of this like crumpled eight foot tall, roughly like pleather phallus that's like frozen in this static um, performance. And so I graduated from the, the Kansas City Art Institute in 2015. And about a year later, I moved to Columbus and 
looking for a job around town, I found one um, nearby downtown at Costume Specialists, which is a mascot costume company. And these next couple images are, are from my time being a stitcher at Costume Specialists where we would make, so I was specifically in the inflatable mascot team. So we would make um, costumes like Sonic here. Um, also, this was a red panda that we made for the zoo. So this was a really interesting job to find as a, a sewing person with a very niche skill set. I'd already been experimenting with inflatables in my studio and it just like everything aligned in this really um, kismet kind of way. So during this job, I, I learned a lot of new sewing techniques and specifically techniques around inflatables. Uh, I also did a ton of dumpster diving at the end of pretty much every shift. I'd bring home a trash bag full of faux fur and spandex and ripstop um, that I would start to use in my own work at the time. And so working on these inflatable mascot costumes was inevitably seeping into the sorts of things that I was developing in the studio. Um, so I started playing with these forms that are a similar kind of scale. They're like eight feet tall, roughly. Um, and I wasn't necessarily thinking of these as characters um, from the beginning. They were more like body-sized forms um, sculptural objects, but as I was developing this body of work, they very much turned into these kind of ambiguous mascots. Uh, the series that I called the sen or call the sensational inflatable furry divines. Um, so this is an image of four. There are five in the series. Uh, the one, the second from the right, um, I'm actually going to be installing that up in the loft after the presentation today um, for the for the loft show. Um, but these, these characters, this body of work, um, they're abstract mascots that aren't necessarily motivated by consumerism, um, like some of the high profile commercial characters that I was working on in my day job. Uh, instead for me, these, these pieces, these characters represent, um, complicated or abstract feelings around bodies um, or concepts like fearsome desires or insatiable appetites. And so each of these uh, pieces resides on its own little stage and they're also each set to a timer. So they alternate between inflation and deflation. They're kind of performing and transforming on their uh, stage. And occasionally they sync up in the and the performance. I've also set them to motion sensors before, which is kind of fun because as you approach, they like activate for you. Um, so it's interesting. I love the, the opportunity to install them like all as a series together because they really become this series of bodies, this kind of cast of characters that's having a, a conversation between them. So I'll just quickly kind of go through the five in the series. We first have Jester, the furry divine of cowardly courtship. Luther, the furry divine of questionable head. This is Solo, the furry divine of fearsome desires. Corona, the furry divine of insatiable appetites. The title was a full two years before the pandemic. It was totally a coincidence. Um, and the last one in the series, uh, Sabina, the furry divine of violent revelations. And this is the one that I'll be installing um, just this afternoon for the show up here. Um, so with Sabina specifically with this piece, I was thinking a lot about um, violence in lots of different forms, um, kind of taking stock at a lot of violence that I've, I witness and, and see and specifically directed at, at my community and the queer community, um, violence directed at queer people or trans people and um, the real outrage that I can feel at that, um, at those uh, at those expressions of, of violence or hatred at the same time that like, I'm a massive campy horror movie fan. So like, how is it that on one side of me, I love like this kind of campy gesture of violence. And on the other side, there's, there are these real displays of violence um, directed uh, that really um, bother me. Uh, also thinking about like the violence of whiteness um, was, was a big part of this piece the violence of repression, the sense of like something bleeding through to the surface. Um, so anyway, all of those like ideas really informed the, the formal direction of this piece that's this kind of 
inconspicuous white object that has this red glittery gash that could be a wound, it could be a shedding or a portal. It's kind of ambiguous about like what this object is um, evoking or embodying, but it really considers all those uh, ideas around violence. This is another series um, that I call The Buddies um, that I started while in residence at the Aramont School of Arts and Crafts. Uh, Aramont is an arts and crafts school in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. It's a wonderful place. I highly encourage you to, to look into taking workshops down there. Um, I, I created this piece um, thinking a lot about community and kinship, um, oftentimes as kind of a lonely queer person in these like craft communities that I find myself. So I was making these uh, buddies um, and the scale here is about, they're like 18 inches tall. Uh, and there are a few of them um, in the show outside as well. Uh, and as I made them, the, the body of work grew into this ongoing piece that I call the buddy community. So they're um, in lots of different forms and it's never displayed in the same way twice. It's, it's a constantly changing piece. I like, I like that sense of um, new potential that a piece can hold, that it can take on a new form over time. So these buddies, they really blur the, the line of like stuffed animal, pet, person, costume, fetish object. It's unclear if they're in their natural skins or if they're in some, uh, sort, some form of costume. So again, that sense of ambiguity around bodies is something that I think is really exciting um, and, and something that I like to uh, uh, encourage people to um, talk about. Um, in terms of ambiguous or unexpected displays of bodies. Uh, these next couple pieces were sort of an evolution out of the, the buddies work. So they're soft sculptures that are more ambiguous than maybe the buddies, but are still relating to bodies in some ways. Uh, they also play on expectations of soft goods like bags and kind of play on your expectations of those things, um, confusing their sense of utility. It's a lot of soft forms coming into contact with hardware. That contrast of, of soft and hard um, is something that I explore a lot in my work. Uh, and also, as someone who's, who's sewing primarily as my main process in my work, quilting is, is a really important thing that I'm considering. And as a queer person, for me, when I think about quilting and sewing, I immediately think of the AIDS memorial quilt. Um, which is this massive uh, um, soft monument of um, quilt blocks that memorialize the thousands of lives lost to, to AIDS, HIV and AIDS over the years. Um, and it travels the world, um, displayed in all kinds of different places to, to honor those lives. Um, so this idea of this craft monument, this idea of, cra of quilts specifically as a way of memory keeping, storytelling, and the connections to, to family and lineage. All of those ideas around quilting are, are very much in my head as I'm making pieces that address um, that specific craft, especially this idea of family and, and lineage. Like as, as queer people, this idea of chosen family is really important for us. So when I think about a quilt, I'll often hear stories from friends of like, I inherited this quilt from my grandmother. This quilt tells me this story about our family. And, and I love those stories. And I also think that in queer communities, uh, they don't necessarily have like those kind of strong biological relationships to their families. So quilts for me also become a, a, a metaphor for like piecing together a new sense of community. So these are some pieces where, where I'm addressing um, languages around quilting more specifically. This was, this was the first piece where I, um, was thinking about a quilt very directly. So there are these kind of uh, vinyl envelopes that are containing these uh, intricate pieceworks that are smushed in there. So it's kind of this modular archive uh, of these, these patchworks. And, and similar to the, uh, uh, the AIDS Memorial quilt, there's this sense of like uh, modularity that that this could be they're just held together with these chains which could be undone and new blocks could be added to them and it could um, change and, and grow over time uh, I also wanted to get into so with this other 
with this last piece, it was more piecework than actual quilting. And I wanted to make pieces that actually quilted. There's kind of this conflation between piecework and quilting, where piecework is the, the, the seaming together of material and quilting is the actual piercing through of multiple layers of fabric to get that kind of puffed raised texture. So I wanted to challenge myself to actually quilt something, um, but to still at the same time uh, innovate and find some uh, new way to form a quilt. So these next couple of pieces are made from these small quilt blocks that um, are then held together with the, the grommets and the metal hardware. This piece here is, is four times the scale of that last one. It's uh, about three feet by three feet. Um, and, and just playing on those, those techniques that I was exploring even more, this real investigation of, of color and, and pattern. Um, and, and as I kind of alluded to before, thinking about quilts as inheritance objects and um, thinking about the kind of quilt that I might, uh, the metaphorical sort of quilt that I might have inherited from my queer ancestors or a kind of quilt that I would want to leave behind for my queer descendants. Uh, within the last few years, my, my work has taken on a much more architectural turn. Uh, so these next pieces will will engage with with those those pieces. Um, the, starting with this this project, the waste of art blocks, um, I stopped throwing away any of my scrap material um, in the spring of 2019 uh, and um, made these cubes with them. It was, it started as just like getting really fed up with seeing how much trash that I was throwing away and trying to find a use for everything. Um, and it became this, this ongoing project, um, similar to the buddies or some of my other works, um, where I'm kind of making these components that can be reconfigured in different ways. Um, so they're building blocks. Um, they're building blocks that tell a story of the materials that I use. Um, they're showing the, the impacts of my um, consumer habits, the impacts of my art practice. Um, so it's kind of a, um, a funny thing because as this piece is growing, it becomes on one hand, a little bit more of a burden and more of a reminder of my implication as a maker. Um, and as a consumer, but it also presents more creative potential the more that I make it. Um, and the ability to make larger, more complicated structures or pieces. Uh, it's also a bit of my like Wally moment, like I'm just making trash blocks. <laughs> Max, let's take a moment. And if anyone has any question, reflection. Sure. Yes. Yes, when you're making stuff and you're trying to save all the products that you're trying to recycle and you're making stuff, don't you buy more stuff to make and you create more recyclables? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by recyclables. Um, you said you was recycling crafts. Oh, sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I try to prioritize as much as I can material that I find. So I definitely purchase things and continue, as, as you're saying, like maintain that cycle of consuming and waste. Um, Don't you think us as assumers that we keep buying and buying and, and we try to recycle and basically it's hard to, the society is keeping recycling but they keep on buying. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, we are we are a consumer based society that really wants people to constantly consume. Well, you think um, 150 years ago, they didn't have that problem. Yeah, yeah. It's definitely uh, a trait of our modern society. It, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's in every facet. I think of our society. It's not just in goods. It's in how we consume media and news. I mean, it's it's the sense that you have to constantly be taking in something and not like in terms of information or news, it's not even about sitting with it and really considering it. That I mean, I think that's why people are so polarized these days is, is that there is 
a lot less criticality in how we consume, whether it's news or like the things that we buy food wise or, or, uh, consumer goods. Um, it's just kind of what it is to be in this society is, is constantly consuming. Yeah. And what you brought forth here is beautiful. Yeah. It's very that nice. Is beautiful. Thank you. Can I hear someone here? Yes. You, you've made these building blocks. I assume you build different things for different exhibits or move them around and change things. Yeah. It kind of um, depends a little bit on the space. Like if there's, if, if the space, um, if it needs to be more of like a wall thing, then it can kind of be a larger, like crawling up the wall sort of thing. Um, if there's more floor space available, then it can kind of build into a structure that can be walked around. Um, so yeah, I like to have it take on different forms. Did you learn to sew in undergrad or did you like practice on your own or how did you become such a proficient at sewing? Like your sewing is amazing. Thank you. Um, thank you for saying that. Yeah, I learned at an undergrad. That's where I first started sewing. Um, and it just really stuck with me. Uh, I really liked sewing as a form of building. Um, and once I, once I found the materials that I really liked to work with then ev every chance I got, I was just like in front of the sewing machine, um, learning and challenging myself. And then day jobs, um, like working at the costume shop. I've also done a lot of work for other world here in town. Um, so my professional work, um, that sust sustained me over time as well has also been like a learning experience. And I've learned a lot of skills through that stuff too. Yeah. yeah. So I imagine a lot of your work is conceived and then fabricated. And in this example, you're constructing something out of components, a building block sort of approach. You did this as a way to, to kind of resolve waste that you had. Are you using this sort of building block technique? Are you finding that moving forward in your work that you're bringing that approach to other pieces? Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a really good question. Um, and it definitely... Can I come on that question? Catherine, that was very comprehensive. He's, he's using a building block technique here. Have you used that building block technique to inform your future work, your other work? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, this next piece is, is a really good example of that. Um, so I, I kind of go between different modes of working. There are times where I have a vision and I want to execute that vision and the object is done. Um, I also get really bored working that way sometimes. And, and sometimes like with this piece, which I'll talk a little bit more about, um, I, I need to not know too much about what I'm doing. Uh, so I like to make components um, that can be arranged in lots of different ways or, or played with in different ways. Like play is, is one of the words that um, people used to talk about my work so much. People say that my work is so playful. Um, and I, I had to kind of sit back and think like how much play is really happening when I'm just like, I have an idea, I'm sitting at my sewing machine, I'm doing the thing and it's done. Like how can I actually be playful with the work? And I think that comes from not having all the answers, not knowing what something is going to turn into. Um, so for this piece, um, it's it's comprised of these, um, it's all modular. Um, they're like roughly 10 inch, um, like each piece would roughly be like a 10 inch cube sort of architectural component. Um, and uh, it kind of resembles like pet furniture in a way. Um, I just wanted to make this like these architectural components that were very alluring uh, and this this combination of faux fur like with architecture was like an interesting um, surprising combination um, but I didn't know like what or how I wanted these components to fit together. I kind of gave myself a parameter of a particular scale and a particular material and made components and just played with them. So this, this piece has taken on lots of different um, forms over time. Uh, and the way that, it, that I present it now is as this tower uh, that I'm combining with 
found materials. I've also used these pieces uh, as sort of like miniature sets to make videos. Um, and I've had the videos display inside of the piece. I've also had the videos be displayed on their own or on a TV next to the piece. Um, so th these are some details. Uh, the image on the left, you can see some of the, uh, a still of some of the videos. Um, so I don't know. I just, I like things to surprise me. Um, and I like that sense of investigation and discovery. So it's this, it's this constant play of parameter and play. Um, yeah, here are some still images from the, the videos that are displayed. So, um, yeah, having more of a sense of play and not having all the answers and letting something be confusing or a little messy, like that's something I'm always trying to bring into my work because I also have tendencies of like high control, like things have to be executed really well. And, and I'm always trying to like throw some funny little wrenches into my work when I can. Uh, this is another, another piece um, that similarly takes on some different forms as it's displayed. Um, so it's this kind of inflatable uh, wall game board um, that's also engaging with the language of quilting. And I have it uh, displayed in these two modes, what I call daytime mode and nighttime mode. Um, and in daytime mode, it's, it's presented as you see here. Um, the lights are on um, in the in the room. The lights are on, and you can really see the pattern of the the object itself. And there's a video displayed of um, a hand on an iPhone on a selfie light in the center of the screen. And this hand is kind of beckoning you to come close. So it's the sort of invitation to engage with this game or system with an undisclosed logic. Uh, and it as um, and it's also inflated, so it's this kind of like breathing wall. You hear the fans um, as you're um, investigating this object. And there's a still of the video that plays. And in its nighttime mode, it uh, takes on a new form. The lights in the room come off and it becomes a projection screen. Videos are projected from the backside that filter through this, this dimensional object. So you don't have access to the source material and it becomes this real play of um, shifting color and light. Uh, but the the video that I made that's projected, it's kind of a collage of virtual activity of social media, of YouTube rabbit holes, um, of virtual renderings of architecture that I'm kind of like walking through in a software, um, video games. So all of that stuff is kind of collaged into this video and pixelated and distorted. Um, and with this piece, I'm thinking a lot about how our own bodies filter mass amounts of um, digital content and the, the combination of comfort, hypnosis, like a sense of comfort and a sense of hypnosis that um, comes from that uh, constant stimulation. Did that surprise you, or had you thought about that? Right? That was a surprise. Wow. Yeah, I, I, beautiful. Yeah, the projection stuff was not. Um, <laughs> I did not have that in mind when I made the piece. Yeah, mm -hmm. but that just came from making an object and mm -hmm. and being in the studio and trying lots of different things. And yeah, and being present to play. Yeah, I absolutely. Love how you said that. <laughs> Definitely. Um, so this is just a short video showing some of the projection. And this is a, a pretty long video. Um, what I'm showing is only maybe 25 seconds, but the full thing is like 45 minutes, I think. Um, and it the the specific like color schemes and the ways that things are that the lights are changing over the surface it changes so much, as well as the um, the auditory uh, component as well. So. Um, even over the course of that 45 minutes, someone who sees it at 12 minutes would have a very different experience from someone who sees it at like 30 minutes. Um, so I like that idea too, that people can have very different experiences of the work um, at different times. This is um, that piece installed 
not this last summer, but the summer before at 934 Gallery. Um, I don't know if you all are familiar with that space, but it's an incredible art gallery here in town. Um, and then up up high, I had installed the, the videos that I had shared earlier. And so doodling and drawing has always been a really big thing for me. Um, I guess that's another thing that came from my animation days. Um, it's just a way to really quickly think through some ideas and get them down on paper. I don't consider myself a drawer. Like I, I've never displayed drawings or anything. It's purely a, a technical process kind of thing for me, but I do it a lot. Um, and that's been like a really big thing for me during this residency. I, I've been doing so much drawing and sketching and plotting new ideas for, for um, bodies of work. Um, and as I mentioned in the last few years, thinking of more architectural ideas, the, the doodles I'm doing become a lot more structure based. And yeah. Where do you um, get your ideals? Does, it, does this come from nature or the surroundings or it just pops out of your head or where, where's the, um, the inspiration? Yeah, sure. It comes from a lot of places. Um, it comes from, so I mentioned at the beginning, this uh, connection to theater and performance, um, that's a huge source of inspiration for me. Um, but architecture itself is, is a really big influence too. Even just walking around the city and seeing a particular way that a, a building is constructed or um, some certain forms will just kind of stick in my head and I'll need to get into the studio and sketch them out. Um, but like specifically for this residency, I, I biked here um, from home most days and being able to bike through downtown um, so many days, like that was such an inspiration for me of just like every day, just on my bike, like being around all these buildings and um, the bridges and, and just like thinking of, of different structures, um, being surrounded by so many structures, like, yeah fed into my ideas. Um, so with this, this next piece I'm going to talk about, um, I wanted to take one of these like really quick, fast doodles and spend a lot of time with it. Um, so I started to translate like just a really quick doodle I had into uh, Google SketchUp, which is a basic kind of 3D modeling software. And I wanted to use this as a blueprint for a much larger uh, inflatable sculpture. So this is in, in progress of uh, translating from virtual rendering to um, actual object. And this is the piece completed in its deflated form. Um, so it starts uh, deflated kind of as this puddle of fabric on the floor that I've had activated in different ways. At this time, it was activated with a motion sensor. Um, I've since changed it, and I'll, I'll, I'll show that in, in just a little bit. Um, but as it activates, it kind of transforms from this puddle and unfurls itself in front of you into this roughly 12 feet wide by eight feet tall by six feet deep structure that kind of resembles a bounce house in a way. Uh, it also engages with this language of like utopian architecture um, from the 60s or 70s. So the way that I think about it, it's this large, vibrant um, invitation of a structure. It has this like super brightly colored interior that's pulling you in. Yeah. Yeah, so this is kind of off the subject, but if I was a little kid, <laughs> I would be focused to go in there. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm not yeah. a little kid, and I'm already focused to yeah. go in there. <laughs> Matt, have you had the experience of having a little kid saying, I'm going in there? Yeah, yeah, that's definitely happened. Yeah. <laughs> playful, wonderfully playful. But yeah, beautiful. it is. At the same time, beauty. Yeah. Is that lit up from inside or just outside? Um, so this, uh, there are windows behind that are kind of backlighting it. Um, so that was kind of a cool specific thing with this with this site being able to have that backlit because it did kind of give it this fun glow. Yeah, the material I use this ripstop it's pretty um, translucent, so the the potential for light to engage with it is um, there's a lot of potential there. Yeah. 
Um, but I like this idea of this invitation from a structure that then kind of like confuses you because it, 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 it plays on your expectation to play and engage, but it doesn't give you a defined way to do it. Um, like this doorway that's carved into it, you can approach the doorway, but the, it, it just looks like a doorway. There's no actual way to enter the object. Um, other than the portholes, which admittedly, when I designed them, I was thinking like, these will be just small enough that like people won't be able to climb through, but they're Surprise. just big enough for people to climb through and for kids. Yeah, absolutely. So How about if we uh, follow you out to the loft gallery? Max, and you tell us about the work you have out there and the surprise. You said you're still engaging with it. Sure. Coming to know it. So let's all go out and see your work in the loft gallery. Okay, sure. All right. So the, the pieces that you see here, this is the, the bulk of the new work that I developed during the residency here. Um, the orange pieces, um, which I'm calling deflations, uh, are all made out of uh, repurposed billboard vinyl that I got from Todd. Um, and this billboard vinyl, uh, I think these specifically were from uh, uh, Panda Express, um, a Panda Express advertisement. Um, they're the same material that's used to protect the floors. Like if you look over the edge, like th those are also repurposed billboards. So there's something fun to me about taking the material that's protecting the floors and putting them on the walls, making them sculptural, um, but also abstracting this kind of language of advertising. So with these pieces, I, I played so much with um, uh, taking apart the the letters and the shapes and combining new patterns out of them. Um, so kind of defying this like expectation of an advertisement. Um, yeah, and I'm like I said, like they're still new and I don't really necessarily know what they are. And um, yeah, but um, they were a very fun like project and play of, of pattern and, and color during this time. Uh, and then this piece in the center was a, a, a new quilt um, that I created during this time as well. So again, wanting to engage with the language of quilting, but um, with a surprising kind of material presentation. So it's all faux fur and vinyl. Um, quilting this thing was very difficult, just having to like roll it up and smush it around and through my sewing machine um, was a real feat, but um, yeah, that's the, the bulk of the new work. And then I also have some other smaller pieces and I'll be finishing the, sure. So installation is still a little underway back here, um, but I've got some smaller pieces, some of the buddies um, from the presentation that I shared, some other quilt pieces. Uh, and then in this nook, I'll be installing one of the those furry divines in that series um, just after this talk. So yeah, that's that's the show. Any if people Any other questions? Yeah. Comments? <laughs> Tell, Tell us about the creatures here. They're <laughs> they're precious. Yeah, the, so these are the buddies, which I, I talked about in the talk. Um, and yeah, they're ambiguous little bodies that uh, are always like chained together in different ways. There's a green headed little weirdo in the middle. Don't really know what's going on with him, but he's cool. He's <laughs> happy to be at the party. Um, so yeah, those are the buddies. A couple of questions. How do you keep people from, from wanting, wanting to touch? Because I'm a tactile person. Oh, me too. As yeah. soon as I see your furry quilt, I want to play with moving. Absolutely. Yeah. This is around. And do you ever, this is the second half of the question, do you ever have a piece where people can interact with it and actually move it? I mean, I'll tell you this. Like, I, I am a textile person through and through. Like, I see something, I want to touch it. And I, I know that uh, association that people will have. You see a furry thing, of course you want to pet it. I never like tell someone don't touch 
the art. Signs that say. Oh, for sure. Not. And I've I've had work shown in galleries before where they do that. They do the big "don't touch" sign, or they put the like barricade around the piece and. I don't know. There's something a little bit sad about that to me. I understand the protection of the art and all of that, but yeah, as long as you don't mind it getting, you know, yeah. messed up. But sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah, everything gets messed up with time, you know. So. Well, true, but extra touching really does. It. That's that's absolutely <laughs> true. Yeah. There's also something fun to me about like you know in an art space you're not supposed to touch the art, so there's this kind of fun tension of like I want to I feel like the material is asking me to touch it, but I'm not supposed to, but I'm just going to get like a quick little touch. Like that whole like train of thought is a fun thing to play on for me, but I never tell someone like, don't touch the art. Um, yeah. Tell us about this piece, the yellow, black, so white. Beautiful. Sure. Beautiful. Um, yeah, that was a, just kind of a quick pattern study um, of showing the kind of white, furry square through the what I view as like four portholes. So it's this kind of play or study of depth through the um, the way that the fur is coming together. They are hollow, hollow, yeah. 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 So that was a fun play of like, how do I get the crease just right? Um, yeah. Max, this was a wonderful time with you as our artist in residence. It's been a wonderful time being here as artist in residence. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm wonderful. sad to see it come to an end, but it's been a lovely time to, to share with you all about the work. Yeah. yeah. Great. Sorry. The future. What will be the next? Yeah, year? that's a good question. Um, Everybody hear that? No. Just Sophia. Just what? What will your imagination take you in the future? Do you think or you just open? Mostly just open and we'll see. Um, but I, I definitely like this architectural train of thought and getting bigger and more immersive. Um, so we'll see. Maybe that's the direction I'll be going in. Yeah. Do you Thank teach you. anywhere? Um, not consistently or formally, but I'll... I Hello. Um, but I'll, yeah, I'll do workshops at various places or visiting artist gigs at universities. Um, but yeah, I don't teach anywhere consistently. I think you'd be a good teacher. Do you agree? Absolutely. You are engaging. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank Absolutely. you for saying that. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.